Sophie, um, she's one of five. I think I have a bad habit. Uh, that's Brady. All my children have four legs. Anything else is working on? There she is. There she is. That's Simon. That's Maddie. Just to keep things interesting. And that's my baby Pixie. <laughs> yeah, good evening. How's everybody doing? 
My name is Brenda Torres. I'm a partner with Kirk Horwa. Um, I'll introduce our firm a little bit later, but I always like to provide some personal context so you know why I'm here and why I'm passionate about this community. So born and raised in South Bend, Indiana. You're going to see here that I went to play high school. That is a colonial. So I found out today that Deb actually went to, to Adams, so she's an Eagle, so I think we're rivalries. I've always stayed in this community, so I attended college at the University of Notre Dame, majored in accounting. And I've had an opportunity to work at Crow since the inception of my career, so that's just over 24 years. My passion are my three children that you see here. Um, furthest to, I guess, your left, that would be Austin. He's my oldest. He's at Notre Dame. To the far right is my other son, Anthony. He's going to go to Western Michigan. And then my daughter in the middle has also informed us that she's going to go to uh, Western Michigan. Um, I'm very passionate about integrating professional and, and personal and anything I can do to, to help the community. Happy to do it. So Beth and they somehow had a connection to uh, our CEO. I think they were former classmates. He was from the Elkhart area. And she uh, asked if I would present tonight. So it's certainly a pleasure to be here. And I look forward to talking with you and really, I think, entertaining your questions as we go along to make it interact. OK, so I'm going to cover. Again, more of the brand piece, so discovering and developing your brand is where we start. So looking at this flat pattern t-shirt, if it had the Tommy uh, Hilfiger label on it, what do you think you'd pay for that? Any guesses? 54 bucks. <laughs> oh, yes. 49, right? <laughs> so if it had Land's End, which we love, but what would you pay for it? I think 35. How much? 30. Close. 24. All right, and then our, our friends at Haynes. The guys usually know this one. Oh, close. Close. <laughs> close. Yeah. Four. Four pack for 11.98. So when you look at this, you know the value of the black patent T-shirt, the Tommy Hilfiger versus the black patent T-shirt Haynes. Is it that many times better? Like, what are we buying here? It's a black patent T-shirt. So you know what you're buying is. Tommy Hilfiger brand, you know, the, the um, kind of setup that they do, you know, there's a certain expectation when you say Tommy Hilfiger, right? And then like Haynes, it's a good brand, but it's kind of more like everyday commodity kind of brand, right? So that's really what we're talking about when we talk about the value of brand. And Tommy Hilfiger spends a lot of money creating that brand. So if you don't, if you don't have a brand, you sell by price, right? And if you sell by price, you're a commodity, you're just generic, like, well, I don't know, like toothbrushes used to be, but aren't anymore now that we have some here. Um, <laughs> so, brand, what's it about? It's about distinction. So why am I better? What is my, my evidence of distinction than another brand? So I always like to think of Starbucks and, um, Let's say 7 Eleven. Very different coffee experience. Starbucks is another one that invests a lot of money in their brand. They have a distinction. Right away, you know they're different. This is a great quote um, about brand and just the value of it, right? So, um, John Stewart, former CEO of Quick Roads uh, from Chicago, said if this business were stood up, I'd give you the land and the bricks in order. I'd take the brand and the trademarks, and I would fare better than you. So he'll give you everything, and he'll just take the name of the little quick roads guy, and he'll make more money because that's the brand. It's rolled oats in a cardboard container, but somehow, through their brand, they've convinced us that it's better, right? That's the value of brand. And here's the literal value of brand. This is to show really on the on the money side. There is an actual line item for brand when people, you know, have their books. If you want to buy just to Apple, that's a lot of money. $178 billion just for the logo. You don't get anything with that. The logo and the name. So it just goes to show that brand has value. And sometimes it's something that you can't pick up. Most of the time it is. So branding versus brand. Brand is that claim of distinction. It's your line in the sand. It's, it's what you promise your consumer, be it that a service or a product. It's a particular kind of something. 
branding is a tactical execution of the brand. So it's your logo, your tagline, your colors, maybe your spokesperson. Um, it's how the store looks when you go in. That's all branding. Very carefully thought of though. So brand development, the important thing about brand development is it's not a marketing initiative. It's a corporate initiative. And it starts at the top with the CEO. So um, does everybody know Tony Shea? I do not know him personally, but know of him. Tony Shea of Zappos. He's actually going to speak at the Learner. He's amazing. And he um, has this incredible way of running Zappos where it's all about customer service. And I, I, the story I used to tell was that the, um, they can talk on the phone for customer service as long as it takes to resolve a customer's problem. The old, um, the old, let me see, the old, uh, I'm, I'm searching for the word, time that they were on the phone, so like, it was three hours, right? And so that used to be like the gold standard. Somebody said, oh, I was on the phone with the customer for three hours. No, it's 10 hours now. 10 hours. Somebody was on, I don't know what they talked about, but they were on the phone for 10 hours with this person, and that was okay. Like, they, they encouraged that. Um, and I was reading a story about them where they have uh, in their office a board that shows how many times they sent flowers to people. Some lady called in and customer service and said, hey, you know, I ordered these boots for my father and he passed away. And they said, don't even return them, just give them to someone in need, you know. And then the next day the guy that talked to her sent her flowers. That's customer service. And that's people that understand brand and are empowered to be able to deliver it. He's one of my favorites. So it starts at the top of him. He drives that through his whole organization. So it's that kind of distinction. And again, his is delivering wow service. And it's the, the brand development. Like when we do brand development, it's that process of uncovering it. Because you can be too close to your own brand to even see it, really. So when we became certified brand strategists, one of the things we did was go through the process, and that's how we came up with our left brains, right brains, brand souls. You know, highly technical, very creative, all driven by brand. So branding again is that tactical execution of the claim of distinction. So the. The brand, a powerful brand, and again, Tony Shea as an example, he aligns his vision, his culture, and his image. I mean, everything he does relates to customer service. And he said he can sum it up in one word, what makes them different? Phone, cell phone. And he said, you know, they're not going to go anytime soon to all the bots and stuff that can help people. He encourages people to talk on the phone and help people. <coughs> So when we do brand development, we say, who are you? What do you do and why does it matter? Who are you is pretty easy. You know, usually what you do, most people know that, but why does it matter? It's the why does it matter, getting to the heart and soul of what really drives people from the CEO level down. And Brenda's is going to talk later about just, you know, how having your whole internal culture understand that is important and the value that that brings. So brand development is built by delivering on that name of distinction internally and externally, built from the inside out first. I hope nobody is here from Comcast, but they're usually my example. They on the television will say, oh, you know, customer service, you're important to us, and, and how you know much we care about you when well when you call them, not generally the experience that you have. That's a brand gap. So that's somebody who's not getting the message that the customer is actually valued and important, right? So you have to build the brand from the inside out. Brand activation. Now this is kind of building brand from the inside out. So the first step is really the internal tactics. That's what Tony Shea would say, you know, that's the training that all the customer service people go through so that they can understand the brand. Then because of that training, there's adoption. And then his people become true ambassadors. Then and only then do you talk about what you have, what you're going to offer, your brand of distinction to the world. Because if the people internally don't know it and don't follow it, believe it, and live it, it doesn't matter. Because the customer is going to get to that point with their interaction with them, and it's going to it's going to be a miss potentially. 
and that's where you get lost. So Patagonia, I picked them and as, a, as an example because of their sustainable practices. Um, do you have a Patagonia hat on? You do. Oh, I like that. She was supposed to wear Patagonia. I know, right? right? We talked about that it. That was not a point of store. <laughs> okay, see, yeah. No, are you a rap fan? I'm a fan. You're a fan? Okay. Yeah, I don't have any brand. I'll tell you, when I was looking for a sustainable brand to talk about, I was floored. And like, I don't own their stuff, and I'm a fan. But I know, like, this is their, their mission, build the best product, cause no unnecessary, unnecessary harm, use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. Like, wow, that's way more important than making coats. So if you have that understanding, holy cow. And, I was just blown away when I started doing research. They actually have on their website a blog that they talk about what their brand ambassadors are doing to better the world. They um, have another part on their website that answers with action. You can put in your state and your zip code, and it'll tell you how to get involved locally where you are. That, to me, is just incredible. Then they also have a thing where you can, did you know they have this? You can send in your clothes and they'll repair them and send them back. And they have 1% for the planet every single day. They donate 1% to environmental crisis management. I mean, that to me is walking the walk, right? So Patagonia to me is now not about clothes. It's about a whole lot more. And I was super, super impressed with these, with these guys after I started doing research and I have to go buy a coat now. <laughs> um, and really, Simon Sinek, Everybody familiar with Simon Sinek, his power walk. Authenticity is more than speaking. Authenticity is about doing, which is Patagonia right there, right? So every decision we, we make says something about who we are. That he is, that speaks to the brand, you know? Because all the people at Patagonia, they're living it. And then the people that wear their clothes, they're living it too. So that is, I think, yes. It's up to you. That's me. Any questions? Just about brand before I talk about it. Yeah. about Crow? Mm -hmm. That'd be interesting to see what she thinks of our brand. Okay. I'm present this, right? We'll talk. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? No? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. So, how many people have heard of Crow? Okay, so you have. So, are you familiar with Crow Horwath? Are you familiar with Krochinik? Both. Both? You're familiar with both? Okay. So Krochinik was actually founded in South Bend in 1942. Uh, there was uh, the head of the accounting department at Notre Dame, Cleet Chizik, and Fred Crow Sr. actually formed a partnership. So Crow's actually been in business for over 75 years. So pretty impressive. And I wanted to share that because I wanted to talk a little bit about how we've grown, and for those of you that are not familiar with Crow, I thought it was important to share a little bit about our organization, what it is we do, so then you can better understand our sustainability practices and how that applies to our organization. Oops. I don't want to make that. Go ahead. So, actually, from a branding perspective, um, smart decisions and lasting value. That, that is our brand. Uh, this organization has grown tremendously in the 24 years that I've been at Crow. We have over 40 offices today. So if you think about it, we started in South Bend, Indiana. I would tell you that we expanded and grew really regionally. So I don't know that I have in here a map of all of our offices, but you would see this really high concentration in the Midwest. So I like to think of it, I'm from here, so I like to think of that as kind of the Midwest values. And I would say those Midwest values resonate as we've expanded across the United States and even globally, if you will. And as we went through and identified our growth strategy, we really realized there were some pretty key strategic markets that we needed to be in. So at this point, we really haven't chosen to exit very many markets. So again, the high concentration in the Midwest, probably some smaller cities, you could say, well, why is Crow there? It's part of our values, it's part of our culture. It's, you know, we had reasons we invested in those geographies to begin with, but as we expanded and grow, we grow nationally. So anyway, we have more than 4,100 professionals. Actually, the slide was just recently um, updated, so we have certainly grown tremendously. We are the eighth largest public accounting firm uh, in the United States. 
So we've got your gamut of you know what you would expect from professional services, public accounting firms. You've got tax. You've got audit. You've got advisory services. We've got risk, and we've got performance. So we do run a, a full suite of services that we deliver. I'm actually in our audit business unit, so I've always been an auditor. Some organizations embrace auditors. Maybe it depends on where you sit in the organization. Uh, other, others, I think, treat auditors like we're their, we're their enemy. Um, but one of the things that I think it speaks to our culture and our values, so 24 years at Crow, and I probably feel like I've had a number of different jobs and opportunities within the organization. So I've changed areas of expertise. I started out primarily in manufacturing and distribution. I had a hodgepodge of clients as well. I audited an insurance agency, a law firm, some HUD projects. But we're really about deep specialization. One of the things I always did in the summer is I also audited our ERISA plans, the so 401k, defined contribution, defined benefit health and welfare plans. Audited those, and then about probably eight years ago, I really got involved in statewide retirement systems. So those are actually considered governments, and I've really enjoyed that. Enjoyed that, and really, when you talk about sustainability and you talk about sustainable practices, it's really interesting to watch that through my particular client base. I've got a number of leadership positions. I've been involved and very passionate about diversity and inclusion programming about around women's initiatives. So it's really, truly been a, a great experience for me. And the reason that I share all of that, it's really not about me. I think it speaks to the culture and really our brains and why I would choose to be with the same organization for my entire career. So our brand, I shared with you, smart decisions and lasting value. And we did an analysis, and really that analysis, and that spoke to this, I think, a little bit. But we really looked at, started at the top for our CEO, but we really looked at our culture, our values. So we have values. They've stayed the same. We care, we share, we invest, and we grow. Care, share, invest, and grow. And it's funny because people have grown up in the organization and just pulled up your tongue. Care, share, invest, and grow. We also surveyed our clients. So what do our clients have to say about us? And frankly, what do our employees, what do our people have to say about us? And we put all of that together as well as a market analysis, and that's where we came up with smart decisions, lasting value. We believe that if our people take care of if our people take care of our clients, then our firm's gonna grow and it'll take care of ourselves. And our responsibility is then for us to take care of our people, right? So it's that intersection. We were recently listed as one of the best, 100 best companies to work for by Fortune magazine. That's the first time that we've ever been honored with that distinction, so I'm certainly proud of that as well. And then sustainability, and then I'll get into how sustainability applies to Crow. So uh, one definition, ensure global development meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. I think that's very important. So you might ask, how can a business be profitable and at the same time contribute to sustainable development? Any thoughts? Oh wait, I'm supposed to tell you that, right? <laughs> All right. So I mentioned earlier triple threat, right? So it's that intersection between your people, your planet, and social responsibility and your profit. So you've got social responsibility, economic viability, and environmental production. So that's what we look at when we talk about all the things that we do at Crow. So I'm going to dive into each one of these particular areas. So from a, from a social perspective, we've got a number of different strategies that we find are very important to our culture. I'm going to name just a couple of those. The very first one is the women leading at Crow. So this is really programming around women in the workplace, um, gender neutrality, if you will, opportunities for women certainly deserve, so you don't promote people just because of their gender, if you will, but making sure that, you know, I grew up in a, a white male dominated firm. That's really what I joined 24 years ago. Our firm is very different today, but in some cases you've got to make a conscious effort 
to, to make investments to, to change that, right? And to make sure you're focused on those initiatives. And it really starts with on the college campuses. So places like IUSB in terms of the type of people that we want to that we want to hire. Um, we have a number of different people resource networks. So African American, Asian, gay and lesbian allies, and Latino. So again, we're looking to develop this very inclusive environment. We want everybody to come to work to feel like they can show up and be who they are and feel accepted for who they are. And that's very, very important to us. In addition, if you think about healthcare, you think about your traditional benefits, right? So you've got your, your paid time off, your parental leave, which includes both the women and the men. Um, you've got all the different benefits, healthcare, that sort of thing. But in addition to that, we are really focused on incentivizing our individuals towards health and wellness. So how can we incentivize people? We've set up portals where you can actually go into the portal and log what you're doing to contribute to your own wellness. And you can earn gift cards, you can earn points, you know, you can earn money towards contributions, towards gym memberships and that sort of thing because we believe that your health and your well-being is very important as to how you show up to work each day community involvement. So we recently celebrated our 75th anniversary, so we made a goal for ourselves. We want to contribute 75,000 hours of community service within a year to celebrate our 75th anniversary. And I think we're a little over 60% of achieving that goal. And in addition to that, we recognize the contributions that we're making to the community. And so therefore, you, you get paid time off. And we develop these community service um, the community service ideas and events and allow people to sign up and participate in those because we feel very passionate about giving back to the community. And then in addition to that, you know, when you want to build a sustainable environment, you've got to reinvest in your people. And I think many organizations do this, but we certainly invest in learning and talent development. So the curriculum that we offer through Colonel Rock University, I'm actually the dean. This is kind of fun. I'm actually the dean of a college. So I'm the dean of the auto college within the Crowell Rock University. So I'm in charge of that curriculum as it relates to our audit insurance practice. And so we need to make sure that we either develop the curriculum internally or we offer the opportunity for people to go externally to get the training that they need, both in the technical skills as well as in those soft skills. Oh, this is my favorite. So we have this mobility policy. And I didn't, I didn't know if I was going to embrace it at first. Um, so one of the big things we did probably the last couple of years, and these ideas really come down for our, from our CEO, Jim Powers. He's very, very impressive. But where to work and what's where. So I told you we have 4,100, over 4,100 individuals. You are not required to come to work every day. You do not have to come to an office every day to work. It's really about how effective you are. We want to measure the outcomes and not necessarily measure the inputs. You don't have to show up at 8 o'clock and work until at least 5 or after. So the organization trusts you to understand your role, your responsibility, how you're going to get your work done, and you can choose where you work. I have an individual that I work with here locally in South Bend. She is managing a lot personally right now. Uh, she is driving her kids kind of back and forth across town to a different school district. And so we needed to work on a client together. So you know what we did? Um, out on Elm Road, there's a really great library there. And we reserved a room and we worked at the library in our sweats. It was great. So it wasn't about how we showed up and what we wore, but it was really about the outcomes of that time spent together being very effective serving a client. So what to wear? I didn't know that this was going to be such a big deal. But we also trained, uh, changed our dress policy. So when I first started at Crow, we were all professional. So whether you were in the office, you went to the client, it didn't matter the industry for that particular client, we dressed professionally. Then we went to, like many organizations, then we changed our culture a little bit in terms of what to wear. And we said, OK, well, if you're in the office, you can be business casual. And if you go to clients and they're business casual, then you can choose to be business casual as well. Now, we have a very robust and pretty large financial services practice. So we go to banks a lot. Many of the banks are still professional, so those auditors are going out in the field and they're still wearing professional attire. It used to be that on Saturdays in public accounting, there's this busy season and many people work on Saturdays. So maybe on Saturdays you could wear jeans or if there was a special event to raise money for a particular organization, you could wear jeans. 
Well, now you can show up in jeans every day. You still need to be professional, so we can't wear tennis shoes. You need to make sure you look professionally. But I did wear jeans today. Actually, I did this for all of you. I'm not a big jeans fan, but I've embraced it. I feel like as a leader of the organization, I need to show up each day and show everyone that's around me that I've embraced that policy. I'm very supportive of that policy. And I'm going to go ahead and emulate that policy and show my support for, for all of the people that work for us. And it is so interesting to me how those two things alone have really resonated with all levels within the organization. All levels, all backgrounds, ages. It, it's been amazing and it, it's great. And the other thing that it's done is what it's allowed us to do, which may, may make some industries not very happy with us, is we don't need as much space. So we're certainly not, so we own our building in South Bend, it's because we were founded here. So it's the only part of, the only real estate that we actually own as an organization. But in all those other, other locations, we lease. Well now guess what, we're actually leasing less space. I didn't realize, and maybe you're all accustomed to this, I mean it matters when you do come to work what's available to you. Some people want to stand up because they think it's help, healthier, better posture, you're burning more calories. We've got these, I don't know if they're called stability balls that you can sit on. So we really try to change the space that we do have, make it very appealing to our workforce, um, encourage collaboration, and let you focus on your health and wellness. So I think it's pretty cool. It's really, it's really resonating with people. Okay. Oh, we weren't kidding. All right. Nope. One more. Economic. Okay. So in economic, again, job growth and career opportunities, I think I spoke to many of those for myself in terms of changing industries to give you a little bit more background. I was in the first class of our Women into Leadership program. Um, really why I was asked to speak tonight is I think Beth really wanted our CEO to present to you, so I'm kind of his stand and I'm probably not as good as he would be. Um, but I've been a part of the CEO Advisory Council, so our CEO has a number of partners that he solicits our impact, our, our input and our feedback on very key strategic initiatives for the firm. So I'm not a part of our board of directors, I'm not a part of our management team, those would be individuals that are actually leading those business units, but he has another set of partners that he comes and asks for advice. Um, in addition to that, I'm a partner in charge of operations for our business unit, which means I'm in charge of everything human resources related resource management, so how we deploy our resources, hiring, that sort of thing, training and development, that sort of thing, and then anything financial. So I'm doing and performing in all of those roles as well as serving some really key strategic clients. And so I think that's why that's important is, when I first joined Crow, I thought, well, this is what you do. You get an accounting degree, you go into public accounting, you get your CPA, and you leave. I totally would tell you that was me. I was that person. And Life happened. I had a child when I was 22. I was a single parent. I had this white male dominated firm and embraced me with my biracial child. And it then became home and my family expanded. And through that experience, I had a lot of needs, right? And so they supported me 22, well, he's 23, 23 years ago with all of those needs. And I think all it takes is one person or one team to really embrace you, and it speaks again to our culture. So here I am in, in very prominent leadership positions within the organization, very visible to a lot of people. And I would have told you, you know, 24 years ago, I'll be here a couple of years and I get my CPI in and move on. So that's very important. Best places to work, I think I've spoken a lot to that. Um, innovation strategy and initiative. So I think you talked about Patagonia giving. 1% back to the environment or to the planet. Um, what we do, and this kind of gets back to our sustainability practices, is 1% of our annual revenue, 1%, so we're just over 800 million. We actually reinvest within the organization for new product development. So we have developed what we call this Crow Horwap Idea Portal, and anyone in the organization can submit ideas. And I actually, I actually sit on the committee where we actually review these ideas and we consider what we want to move forward. Some of these ideas can be as amazing as we have a new product that we want to develop to sell to our clients or future clients. And some of them could be things like, hey, I think we need to do something different in the office. Or, hey, have we ever considered developing a program where we hire individuals with special needs? 
And any single person can put ideas into this idea bundle, and I think it's great. And it actually is one of the things that has truly, truly helped Crow grow. Our chief strategy officer and innovation officer, he came to Crow from a big four firm. At the time, I want to say he was a senior manager, and he had this idea for a solution called Revenue Cycle Analytics to sell to the healthcare organizations because managing revenue in healthcare is very, very challenging. Well, at the time, I don't think the big four firm really thought that was a great idea. He brought his idea to Crow, and through Crow's program of, and our investment in product development, he, with a team of people, developed this product, and it's been extremely successful. So again, we've taught, and I'm not saying that everything always works out as great as that's worked out, but the point is, is reinvesting in the organization, not taking those profits, but reinvesting into new things that we can offer, services that we can deliver. We also have a scholarship and contribution funding, so we have given more than 1.6 million in total charitable giving in this last fiscal year. Of that, over 15% went to colleges and universities. And then we do produce a transparency report on a biannual basis. From an environmental perspective, we do the recycling. I talked a lot about the mobility, and I think it is really important because we have seen our cost of space you know, significantly decrease over time. In addition to that, um, we're a very mobile workforce, so we have a rideshare program. So we developed a portal, so if I'm going to travel to another office location, I can actually put in my travel requirements. And when I'm leaving, you know, what's the date I'm leaving, what time, when do I want to come back, that sort of thing. And it can match me up with other people that are also going to the same location so that we're not both driving at the same time. And then we have a number of Go Green initiatives, um, shared workspace, encouraging teleconferencing and video conferencing. So we've, we've talked a lot about, you know, that the in-person meetings and how nice it is to have in-person meetings more effective, more efficient. We've done a lot of things now through Skype video calls or teleconferences. We even do it with our clients. Again, so we can promote those sustainability practices and actually sometimes it can reduce the cost of our service delivery. Okay, so the business case is probably what we've been waiting for. So there's probably a num number of reasons why we do this. I mean, a lot of people would say, it's just the right thing to do, right? But what does it mean? How does it contribute back to the organization? So there have been a number of studies where there's a positive correlation between the performance of your sustainability practices as well as your per financial performance. So there's something in it, right, for the business and commerce and for the organization. So what do executives think? In 2014, the state of corporate citizen, <laughs> citizenship study executives were asked um, if there were what dimensions contributed to the company's success, and here's what they said, and I'll just name a couple of these. 69% said programs to increase employee diversity. 65% said sustainable use of resources, employee volunteer programs. 64% philanthropy. Philanthropy, oh my god. Philanthropy. Philanthropy, yeah. Oh my gosh, and giving. And then 62% to recycling programs. So again, you're seeing sustainability practices where they're seeing a benefit to this in terms of the company's success. The other thing that we're finding is there are becoming some legal requirements. So it's not unusual for the United States to follow what's going on over in Europe. So the European Union back in 2014 required large companies to prepare non-financial disclosures on sustainability topics. Um, France has re had these requirements in law since 2015 and in Denmark since 20 2009. So the United States is kind of a fast follower, if you will. So the SEC has issued a concept release regarding public company disclosures related to sustainability. I think in the future they're probably going to ask for some assurance relative to those sustainability measures. The IRS has gotten on board and they're issuing rules to increase profit, and tr profit transparency. And then even from a Bloomberg perspective, when you look at the number of investments, you're gonna find sustainability indexes and you're gonna find indexes on ESG in terms of how that organization measures in terms of their ESG performance. And that's gonna, that's gonna matter in the capital markets. And then a lot of what I spoke to is this really increases employee engagement. If you think about wellness programs, volunteer opportunities, mentoring, giving campaigns. So 
So there have been some studies, and disengaged employees cost organizations between $450 and $550 billion annually. Think about that. Think about organizations that you either worked for or had visibility to, and the impact of disengaged employees. What do you mean by disengaged? I would say just not invested. So you come to work and you see it as a job and not a career. You're not passionate about the brand of the organization, what the organization stands for. If you think about, you know, Deb was talking about tone at the top starts with the CEO, it resonates with executive leadership. If you don't buy into that or you don't align to that, you're probably not going to be very engaged in what the organization is trying to do. I don't know if anyone has that. Go ahead. I have a question related to what she was just saying. Yeah. I made a note. You referenced an information portal where people, like employees, could give suggestions on how to reinvest and make their workplace and the environment better. How, how does that look? I mean, in what way is it an anonymous suggestion box or is there a public forum where people meet over? Yeah, so you're talking our idea portal. Our idea portal. Yeah, so idea. you can actually submit under your own name or you can submit it anonymously. It's to your choice. I prefer when they submit it under their name just because if we have a follow-up question, sometimes somebody can give an idea and you may not fully understand the context or the business problem that they might be trying to solve for. So it allows us an opportunity to seek to understand well, what is it you are trying to achieve or maybe there's a larger underlying issue that you're trying to get at. Um, but, you know, it, so it's not public. Everybody doesn't have visibility to that. So what you have is kind of a, an executive leadership team that looks at all of those different suggestions. Some of them are very specific to the services that we deliver or the industries that we serve. And others are very kind of HR-related, office-centric. So we make sure, we make decisions. So some of them we say, you know what? This is a great idea. We already have something in, in process. Sometimes they just don't have visibility that something is already going on. So we already have something in process and they don't have visibility to it or they may have missed a communication. So we might have to get back with them. Um, other times we have to get back and say we're not going to move this forward at this time. Some of them will, will go right into the pipeline for a new product development or new business development. And so there's a, a process to basically request funding to kind of kick something off the ground. And then I think the ones that relate to, I'll call them like HR people policies, we need to talk amongst ourselves in terms of those leading the various business units just to see how different ideas affect different people. So for instance, I'm trying to think if I can come up with an example. There are pockets of our practice where you have individuals that travel quite a bit. And so we offer some additional rewards called it. It's a road warrior program. If you want to then apply that Road Warrior program more broadly, you have to identify the impact of the entire organization. And that impact may be that you have a whole subset of your organization that's already on the road and they're already getting benefits. So in, in, unless it's escalating those benefits to them, they may not be very excited about that. So it's really good to make sure you understand how each of the business units within the organization functions, what's important to them, is you roll out new policies, new ideas, and that sort of thing. So that's why we bring a group of people together. It seems like that would be a key to engagement. You know, yeah, uh, yeah, I think it is key, especially for those that feel like, you know, they've been empowered and can actually, you know, make a contribution that's very tangible that they can that they can see. I mean, I'm sure things like the stability balls and the stand-up desks probably came through the idea portal. And it was those people that were really, really passionate. Either they worked somewhere else what was offered or they had that opportunity at home, so they're pretty passionate about it. And now in many of our offices, that's the design that we have. You know, so it, it gets back to what the people want. So you can see here, if you're highly engaged, you can see the results here. Greater profitability, reduction in absenteeism, and an increase in productivity. And that's really what you're looking for as an organization. Is a excuse me, is yep. a business unit an employee or a group of them? So a business unit would be a group of employees. So if you go back several slides ago when I talked about the different services that Crow delivers, <laughs> the audit services, that's a business unit and it's a separate business unit to tax services, separate from advisory separate from risk and separate from performance. A lot of that has to get to the types of services that we're providing. So one of the things we also deeply invest in is, is we're all about deep specialization. 
So very, very confident in the services that we deliver, but also deeply specialized in the industry that you're servicing. So right now, I'm only servicing retirement systems. So that when I go to retirement system, I understand from an auditor's perspective what their financial accounting and reporting challenges are because I'm very familiar with that particular industry. So that's what I mean by, by business units. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. And then, again, if, if you're taking care of your people, then your people are going to do a better job of taking care of your customers. And if you're taking care of your customers or your clients, it's likely you're going to continue to grow. And that's part of what builds a sustainable practice. The other thing that, that's very interesting is, you know, I think today things have changed a little bit. Oh, gosh, I keep flipping this forward. And um, there have been a number of surveys, this is just one of many, where all things being equal, you have prospects, individuals you know, out there who are saying, I would take a pay cut. I would make 15% less if I could work to an organization who is committed to sustainability for a job that makes a social and environmental impact. So probably Patagonia, right? They probably choose to make less to work for Patagonia, right? And then, or to work for an organization with values like my own. And I think, again, that's what kept me at Crow, or has kept me at Crow now, what will be a lifer, uh, likely as a partner. Um, in addition to that, the Cone Communications did an employee engagement study. Um, they actually differentiated between all employees and the millennials, the, the workforce by 2025 will probably be at least, a majority of the workforce will be millennials. So again, in this particular study, when you think about opportunities, people are considering the company's social and environmental commitments or deciding where to work. They're going to work for socially responsible organizations. And they're going to feel loyal when that company is invested in the same values and the same objectives that they hold. Is this a pro? Employees that were surveyed there, or no? These are these are outside. This is just data in general relative to sustainability in the U.S. Yeah, in the U.S. Good question. Should I clarify that? And then consumers can demand it. So it gets back to you know where are you going to buy your products from. Are you going to research these organizations? Are you going to look you know, to where the clues are made? Is that going to matter to you? Are you going to invest in, in companies that produce their merchandise here in the United States? Or are you going to you know, go outside? Does that matter to you? Are you going to look at their sustainability practices when you choose where to shop? You know, being in the public employee retirement system arena, it's been very interesting to me because they manage incredible investment portfolios. My largest client has about a $250 billion investment portfolio. And if you think about it, and they're a teacher's organization, so they, they're building retirement to fund the, the state teacher retirement system of California, okay? So all of your California teachers. Well, they have ESG policies in terms of their investment structure. So you have to look at your stakeholders. You have teachers that are teaching children so they have passed policies that they're not going to invest in organizations that do business with cannabis or with guns or whatever the stakeholders are passionate about. So they will make a decision or at least contemplate a decision as to whether they want to divest in a security that is profitable to fund future retirement because of what that security stands for. And that's pretty powerful. Very, very powerful. Because it speaks to, again, it speaks to corporate governance. So you see that in a lot of different organizations in terms of what's important to them. And I think from a, a public accounting perspective, there's going to be opportunity for us in the future, again, to pro provide assurance on these sustainability practices. So we talked about... All right, so again, I talked about Bloomberg collecting data and um, customers using that data has more than doubled since 2012. Um, institutional investors are using ESG integration to evaluate risks and opportunities in their portfolios. 
I mean, the, you got the Dow Jones Sustainability in, Index, and then you've got the SASB Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. So I think in the future, there are going to be standards that companies are going to have to abide by. And I think they're going to ask for assurance from independent consultants or auditors like auditors at Crow to give the consumers some assurance as to whether they're meeting those sustainability goals, metrics, and practices. And then really next steps for Crow. You know, this is still a work in progress for us. So again, we want to continue to communicate sustainability into our core business functions. So we want to make sure that we are more transparent throughout the entire organization in terms of what we're doing, how we're addressing it, making sure everybody has visibility to, to our transparency report, probably expand that transparency report in terms of what's made publicly available to outsiders that visit um, our website. And again, we want to have a we want to continue to develop our green teams and do that on an office basis. And then we want to make sure that we're establishing measurements and measuring ourselves and reporting performance, at least internally and then probably externally. And with that, that is the business case of Crow. So I appreciate your, your attention. So um I'm going to take privilege of the floor, which I like to do in these sessions. We're going to pull some chairs up. I'm going to poke at a few things that they raised and sort of rush over and see if they can offer us a deeper dive in. So let's grab some chairs, and then you'll get to ask questions too, which you've already done. marketing branding person, how your brain works and what you're seeing when you see that and say, so how many brands that? How can, what would you uplift or, or highlight? So we're talking about sustainability as brands. We've heard a lot of sustainability, we've heard a lot of brands. But can we bring those together? Well, I think the important thing is that, you know, the, the attraction of employees and the longevity, I mean, that really speaks volumes to the people that go there, I mean, they all have a like mind, so they're building their tribe based on what they're offering. And I think, you know, the, the stuff that you talked about, it was like, okay, the millennials care more now about the fact that your company's going to make a difference and that they they look internally to make a difference in your life, like they did in yours, and you stayed there, right? So I think that it's, you know, it's, it's that attraction and engagement of the employees that keeps them long-term, and that's... Like, like you said, you, know, you go from the inside out. So you're attracting people and they're staying for a long time. They're happy workers. You're going to keep growing the business. Chris, let me add, let me add to that too to kind of bring it back to the, the pro business case. When you're in a professional services firm and you develop relationships with your clients, if it's a positive working relationship, one of the things that's really important to our client base is I want to see the same faces. So I want the same team to come back the next year, especially from an audit perspective. You know, you're getting to know the organization, you're providing services to them. You want to make sure that your auditors are understanding the business, understanding the internal controls of the business. You're asking the right questions, you're asking meaningful questions. And so it gets back to longevity of our workforce because many clients, I don't want to use the word demand it, but they'll ask for it. I mean, you know, we'll engage in, in certain arrangements where we'll have to get approval to change our teams. And, and that's because the team does matter. The individuals providing that service, they do matter. And so when you're speaking about that, it kind of resonated to professional services in terms of what's important. Or when you were talking about customer service earlier in your example, and you talked about the telephone and the people that have the ability to engage with the customers and making sure the customer comes first and, and it feels important and when they don't do that 
I won't say the name again, but you gave an example of an organization that we probably many of us feel very much the same way about what you spoke to. You know, it, you don't feel that. But it, you know, when you talked about the whole, and I, I was trying to think of an instance where um, you talked about sustainability, and it's something that you believe in as a, a company. Anymore, you can't get away with saying one thing and doing another for very long, and you really do a lot of damage to your brand. Whole Foods is, you know, I love Total Whole Foods. It's really sad, but um, they came out with the most ridiculous thing, and people called them on the carpet like right away. It was um, a peeled orange in a plastic container for me, you know, like well, and I, I, I went, how did they miss the mark so badly? You, you don't do that if you're old, right? I mean, <laughs> you just don't. And so that to me, and they got called on it right away, and because they have enough brand equity and people love them, they said, oh, sorry, and we'll take that off. Kind of mistake. You can buy that kind of um, forgiveness if you have good brand equity. Maybe. So I think it's interesting that what you honed in on in terms of building brand equity through a hoop day, sustainability has to do with the, the people that actually work there. And Brenda, you said something about, um, and I'm hoping what both of you can maybe offer some evidence or proof of this, but taking care of the people that work there means taking care of your clients. Do you have a way to say, absolutely, we see a strong correlation between the fact that Brenda was there every single year and therefore we had the same clients? I mean, was there evidence that this really pays off? Yeah, so it's interesting. So I talked about how Crow was founded and we had got, you know, clients here locally that we had had for years, you know, and there are people that had moved on because we had people that retired, you know, we had a lot of partners who start here and they've, they've either relocated or they've retired and they're still clients. And I think it speaks to our brand and I think it speaks to, to our culture. So I actually have a situation that is just happened recently where an organization similar to the, an organization I'm auditing, they're in a bind and they need a new auditor. And and I'm not kidding when this happened, but there was an auditor sighting. So we entertained a meeting at a prospect and that information was shared with my client. And my client was very concerned about me diverting my attention to another organization because they like the attention that they get today. So much so that I recommended to both their CEO and their audit committee chair that they talk to Crows, managing partner of our business units or audit business unit, and our CEO. And those conversations have been had. So when it gets back to the people, that particular, my client is saying, Brenda and Kevin are key to your team. So we understand other people go. But they are really key to us. They are key to executive leadership. They're key to the audit committee. And so that was really important to them. So again, it gets back to, you know, people matter. The other thing I'll tell you when you talk about taking care of your people, I love my firm, but I don't know had they not embraced my personal situation the way that they did. I don't know that I can, I'll be honest, I don't know that I, can, I would still be there. You know, it's about taking care of people. And just today, I've had a couple of different situations navigating through, you know, people have personal challenges. You know, we had a young lady I've worked with her before, and she's got two extremely sick parents, and she's very young. So she said, I need to leave the firm. I need to find a job, you know, where I can work less hours. When I leave at five, I don't have to think about it. Well, why do you have to leave the firm? We have a lot of different opportunities we can offer you. Let us support you through this difficult period of time so you can take care of your personal situation because you've demonstrated so much value already to the organization and to our client base. We can actually narrow your roles and your responsibilities. We can define it a bit more tightly so you can feel successful at work, but I want you to feel like you can be there for your parents. And I don't know if this is six months, a year, two years, but I'm gonna engage in that conversation with that young lady tomorrow. So I think that if you touch one, sometimes you touch many, and we don't broadcast that we did this, but she'll share. She will share that someone reached out and, and offered this help. And I think those things are really important. And so it gets back to if you take care of the people, other things will take care of themselves because they'll take care of their clients. 
and ultimately the firm will sustain and grow. I do believe that. I've seen it play in, you know, play out time and time again. And I have an opportunity in my leadership role to sometimes make that happen if I get wind of, of something going on. So I guess uh, on a lighter note, then I have one branding question and then I'll open it up. Um, I'm not sure, I, I get that I want to be cared for at work and people yep. recognize it, like I have needs that need to be met, but yep. I don't know if um, uh, organic snacks and ride share will keep me somewhere, but there's obviously an extra investment from the company mm -hmm. to do that. Um, so why do you do that sort of environmental piece? You know, it's interesting. I think part of why you do it is, do I think it's going to keep people there? I don't. Nobody's going to stay at Crow because we provide <laughs> organic snacks. They're just not. Frankly, we're not going to keep people at Crow because we like our jeans. But I think it's not one thing that we do. I think it's collectively all of the things that we do that really make their organization. And I think that's a part of why people stay. And I think you have to be very socially aware of what's important to people today. We cannot, we will not be sustainable if we don't have people. We're, we're selling some products, but we're selling people. It's our people that make us grow. So you've got to make them happy. And you know, public accounting is known to be a pretty tough and demanding profession. Some of our business units, they have a very high volume of travel. So, so what do you do for people? I've had situations where I've personally paid for employees that work for me to bring their families for the weekend if we've got to stay two weeks in a row. Do you know how much, it was not a lot for me, but do you know what it meant for them? I mean, it's just those little things. So again, I think you have to look at the person. I'm at a different stage of life today with you know three grown children, almost all of them out of the house than I was 24 years ago. So I don't think it's an individual thing. It's ride share, it's the idea portal, it's recycling. But it also talks about who we, you know, what we stand for. And frankly, when we go through a proposal process and when we're bidding on new work, it's not unusual, especially in the public sector, which is what I serve through these PERS, it's not unusual because sustainability is important to them. They want to know culturally, am I doing business with someone who aligns with my practices? My values, my practices, my sustainability, do we culturally do we align with one another? And I think in many cases we do. Is that written by your CEO? I mean, is that where his head is? Oh, I think, I think very much so. I think he's, um, it's interesting because I think that he is one to push forward ideas, but they don't have to be perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, so we don't have to fully develop a new idea before, we, you know, it's kind of like we've got to be task for You know, when he first, you know, he, when he first put out mobility, those that are more senior in the organization and that's just not the way that he worked, oh my gosh, they struggled with that. Well, how do we know they're working or how do we know that they're engaged? I work from home a lot because I travel quite a bit, so I'm here, I work from home. I always feel engaged with people. Somebody's IMing me, I'm on the phone, I mean, it's like this kind of virtual world. So I think it's just recognizing that the world has changed and technology has advanced us and helped us in ways and now we need to use it to our advantage and provide that connectivity. But it's thought that it really starts with someone at the top. And again, it gets back to, I've now embraced the genes. I didn't, I, when I say I didn't embrace it, it wasn't something that was my, it was my preference. And now I'm all about it. So, so I don't know if that answers your question. It's yeah. not going to keep people, but I think. Part of the whole package of system of care. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm wondering if you can speak of, about maybe some examples we might be aware of or seen in terms of branding or brands that you've worked with um, to uplifted Patagonia. So thank you. I've talked about them a lot okay. because they blow my mind with mm -hmm. just their whole ethos and how they do business and how they take care of people that work there. Um, if you the videos on, I would say, oh, that's at work. You know? <laughs> uh, but uh, how, what have you done in terms of foreseen uh, really effective um, to uplift the sustainability features as part of the branding, whether or not you say sustainability in it. Um, yeah. How are you seeing that as being a branding bonus? Yeah, I mean, I think that it is something that you know, it, it needs to be 
a belief, obviously driven from the top, and then you tell to the world, but you follow it. So, you know, it's, it, I'm trying to kind of gather my thoughts around this, but um, I think that you're like-minded people, but the people that shop at Whole Foods and the people that buy Patagonia and all that, they, they buy into that idea. And so, you know, it's just everything that a brand can do to support that and be transparent about it and, you know, live it, really. Live, live that, that offering internally and then externally to people that they're selling their, their goods to. I mean, I, I shop at Whole Foods because I know that there, you know, no antibiotics and all that, you know, the Whole Foods whole thinking. And actually now Panera is another one I think is doing amazing things. Um, I think they could go a step farther though on the sustainability piece because they use plastic and straws. That's like my new thing. Like the sh those plastic straws are driving me crazy. So, you know, I think there's steps that companies like Panera can take to live their brand of sustainability. They've gone to the clean food, but now they need to go a step farther. Um, Whole Foods has their takeout packages that are not compostable. Um, you know, so it's, it's things like that. It's always keeping your eye on the whole part of a company and making sure that you're sustainable every single place you can be sustainable. If, that, if that's your stick in the ground. And Whole Foods, I think, is in Panera as well. Did that answer it? Okay. <laughs> I know we've got questions out here, so I'm just some hockey men. They're, They're just conversation here. Yeah, wait. So. <laughs> um, Deb, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the brand development process and mm -hmm. how it works. Oh yeah, brand development's a whole lot of fun. Um, like I said, we do the who are you, what do you do, and why does it matter? But essentially, what we do is we meet with the CEO first for about usually three to four hours and just talk. We just we want to find out about kind of why they're in business. We met with um, an engineering person, engineering type person, very you know zeros and ones, um, who owned a company, and it took us about three hours to get to the reason why he did what he did, and it was because his mother died of breast cancer. So his whole mission in life is to create things that don't give off the toxic gases and all that sort of thing, and so that's what his company does. They make sustainable products. Um, so we meet with the CEO, and then we'll meet with the share stakeholders. We do a lot of information gathering, we do a lot of interviewing of people internally at every level, and then we do interviews of customers and clients, sometimes prospects, why they don't do business with a particular company if we can find them. And then we have what we call our day of discovery, and we'll get all the stakeholders in a room, and we start plastering the walls with facts about the company, and we usually get around 100. We call those down to 30 that, you know, is what, um, is this a possible thing that would make you different? In your case, it would be like ride share and your mobility. Yeah, that would make you potentially different because you're trying to distill down the differentiation. And so you get to like three to five, what we call UVPs or unique value propositions. And you say, okay, you know, out of these, what's your promise? And we build the franchise, the essence and the positioning statement for the company. And really all of that is saying, you know, here's what we promise, here's who we are, and then internally we work with their company to train them. So we'll do, do what we call momentum groups. We meet with the corporation probably once every month initially for the first year and then every quarter after that and just make sure that things are, because the brand is a living thing. You can't ignore it. You know, you can't let go of customer service and just assume everybody who comes on board is going to be on, you know, on the right seat of the bus and that whole thing. So that's basically the brand development process. It takes, on average, about mm, 10 to 12 weeks for us to go through the whole thing. Any other questions? Uh, you mentioned a transparency, re transparency report. Uh, is that... Um, what, what does that entail? What does the transparency report report? Yeah, so it goes beyond financial metrics. So it gives a little bit more transparency to how we're doing, how we measure ourselves in a number of different areas. So probably the one that I'll speak to most easily is it gets back to what, what I do, so audit. 
So what's really important in terms of your auditor gets back to the quality of your work, adhering to the professional standards under which we apply. And so we'll go through a number of what we call like audit quality indicators. So we'll identify what are all the metrics that we utilize where we measure ourselves to make sure that we're delivering quality work. So it's not about just being timely, right? And it's not about adhering to a timeline and, and a set fee. But it's also about the quality of what you deliver, if you will. And so what that report does is it really speaks to a number of things within our organization. Other metrics that we have that are not tied to financial metrics that we will publish and, and provide to others so you have more insight into how we operate as an organization. And who's the intended audience for that? So the intended audience uh, primarily is our clients and, and prospects. So if you're looking for a, a public accounting firm or doing research or you're looking for a place to work, you would be able to find this type of information on our website. So you can learn a little bit more about what we do, what we stand for, the different metrics that we have. And is the sustainability practices part of the transparency? We have some sustainability practices in there, but I think you're going to start to see that continue to evolve as we talk about like the next steps and being more transparent and resonating within the organization. You're going to see us building out that transparency report. In fact, it might have been what you, Beth, is that what you pulled up at first when you pulled up Crow? Was our transparency report? So it was on our website. So that's how Beth looked at a crow and looked at some of our sustainability practices because it was some of those practices were included in the report, which she said they might be, you know, local organization or at least founded here might be good for, for this opportunity. There were others, somebody else had a hand up for yep. uh, so you talked a lot about changing company culture from the top down, but let's just say for argument's sake today in the cashier holdings, how would I change the entire company culture like how, what, what's your advice to someone who's on the bottom who wants to change the culture do you feel like um ideas are not readily accepted sometimes they might be sometimes they might not be I mean, okay I don't know. Hmm. that's a tough one i mean because it is top down um you know i i guess i would suggest bringing ideas to whatever level you can get to and speak to um, and, and seeing if they'll pass them up. Uh, any good cl corporate culture, any culture that is worth anything is going to listen to the people that work there. Um, you know, take ideas because great ideas come from everywhere and if they want you to be happy, you need to be heard, right? So, yeah, I guess I would just say, I would just say try and sometimes, I, I'd hate to say, you don't want to be there, but if it's important enough to you to want to make sure that your ideas are heard, then um, it would be a consideration as to whether that's the right place. Yeah, um, over the last decade or so, there's been what they call a programmer. You can get in there for a so it's a big gap. So it's hands. Uh, as companies come to you like, how, have you seen that case? And so, how do you brand a, a, a manufacturing company to entice people who want to look at their hands? Oh, you're asking about like the, the trade gap now? Yeah. yeah, that's a really big challenge. We see that with a lot of our clients. Um, I think that it's a shift in thinking. I think it's, you know, we've gone so far away from, in the U.S., trades as being, there's almost like a stigma to it. And the fact that if you work with your hands, that somehow you're not going to make as right. much money, or you're not going to, and, and that's, that's not accurate. Um, so I think it's a change in culture. I think it's going to take actually probably manufacturers to band together and say, hey, we're going to support either the schools, program of communication that changes the way people feel about that because you know higher education and, and accounting and brand development is not for everybody I mean if you want to build a house that's what you should do so mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a matter of changing the way people think about it and offering opportunities because I, I don't know that they're out there as much and I don't think that um, it's as accepted you know to, to look at your kids so it's like where are you going to go to college mm -hmm. and that's not for everyone so I think it's a matter of changing the way we think about that as a culture. But I have seen it a lot. 
lot of struggle that way. So on that note of changing where we think and changing culture, I'm going to wrap up the formal part just to be respectful of people's time. Um, but I don't think they're running out the door. So if you're like, oh, I wanted to ask something else. We're here. Yeah, we're here. Come <laughs> forward. They're very friendly. Oh, so uh, feel free to come up and ask them more questions if you have them. But thank you so much for thank sharing you. your stories. I've learned from them. So thank you very much. Thanks for your interest. Thank you. And we'll be here next week, same time, same place, different topic, except for sustainability. So.